We could do Tomorrow's World. That's how it's going. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that requires an applause. Thank you. I, I give you the desperate men. Thank you. They did have a very rude joke I'm supposed to tell them, but I'm not going to. Um, so, um, we're on. Jolly good. Uh, I'd like to start off by you introducing yourselves, please. She pointed to me. Uh, I'm Richard Heden, uh, co-artistic director. I've risen up through the ranks to that role. I'm John Bedell. Um, I co-founded the company with Richie Smith in 1980, and I've been stuck with it ever since. And you are the... Uh, our co-artistic director, the other co-artistic director. We, we are the operational managers, if you like, of the company. The we company run it. Being Desperate, Desperate Man. Man. Thank you for the cap. Um, <laughs> lovely. So I think there has to be a starting point for you somewhere. So, John, tell us something about how you started Desperate. Was it you that started Desperate Men? Me and Richie in yeah. Berlin in 1980, where we ended up kind of by accident, uh, though partly chasing um, beautiful dancers, as you did in those days in my youth, um, who led us to the dance factory, dance ta dance fabric in Berlin, where we put our first show together. But previous to that, I'd met Richie in Amsterdam in 77, and we'd uh, toured with Friends Roadshow and uh, various other people and came under the influence of lots of different people in Amsterdam. In the late 70s, it was an amazing sort of cornucopia or melting pot of all kinds of dancers, musicians, actors, performance artists, all kinds of stuff going on and it kind of blew my mind a bit, Amsterdam, and not only because of smoking dope and stuff like that, because there's plenty of that, but there was just an extraordinary sort of cultural um, mixture of people, so very inspired by that. So we did a lot of touring and then uh, ended up in, in Berlin, the two of us, uh, and that's where we called ourselves Desperate Men because we felt a bit desperate just being on the road, the two of us in a beaten up old car and a suitcase of props uh, and made our first show in there. And what kind of work were you making? We did a lot of kind of eccentric dance in those days actually because we, we fell in with a lot of dancers and jazz musicians in Amsterdam so I was very inspired but we were very physical, it was physical theatre I suppose but I was a lot younger then, 20 that's something I suppose. Yeah, there's still quite a lot of physicality in your work though, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. Yeah, I can still <coughs> I can still throw a few shapes when when pushed. Same. Same. And your background before that was uh, I I was in a few school plays in school. I had a very good drama teacher who was also a yoga teacher, so but I didn't realise that at the time. Um, so she taught us to kind of use our bodies a little bit. I suppose, and then I went to Bradford Art College in 1970, and that was an amazing sort of happenstance. I went there because I thought I wanted to be a painter, but in fact I wanted to be a performer, I think, really, and I did the year, the foundation course year of, you know, painting and drawing and ceramics and all that kind of stuff, and then there was a great course by, run by a guy called Albert Hunt, who is worth looking up, Hopes for Great Happenings, as his book. And he ran a quite radical course for uh, people in, um, for students, a uh, film, theatre and television course, and had lots of different tutors in there. So people from People Show, Adrian Henry, Adrian Mitchell, Trevor Griffiths, uh, John Fox, all sorts of people came and did two or three week blocks of work, which is a model that I guess art schools don't have anymore, but it was just a amazing sort of input of ideas and 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 that set me off really on on performing and performance art and live art and all that kind of stuff so that's where i, I came from yeah. richard, richard had a similar sort of thing but your 
I suppose it, st it started for me when I went to college. I went to Roll College in Exmouth, which was part of Exeter University then. And it was a college that trained teachers, but at that time in the late 70s, there was a, the government thought there was a need for less teachers, so they changed courses. Uh, and they had a very strong link with Dartington, so we would get the Dartington students come over, and Debbie were one of those who I met there. Uh, and it was all the sort of, so I went there and did urban studies, uh, which well, really wasn't for me. And in those days, you could get four years of grants. So I did a year of urban studies and then had a sort of uh, a moment of madness and jumped out of the um, window of the economics lecture <laughs> and ran across to see Baz Kershaw, who um, you might have heard of, who uh, is very well connected with welf Welfare State. He was the drama lecturer there. He said, come and move some furniture. So I moved furniture and I didn't know that was my audition. <laughs> and then the next year I did um, a combined degree and Baz and um, uh, a fellow tutor, Dominic Barber, really opened up the world of uh, alternative theatre, I suppose. So we had lots of visiting companies then uh, and residences. Um, that's where I met people like Paddy Fletcher and Incubus Theatre and uh, of course down in Cornwall at that at at uh, that, that point um, were, what's his face? I can't remember now. Footspawn. Footspawn. And there was Hood Fair, and so there was a very exciting... Uh, what year was that then? That what would year? have been 78. Right. So I was there, and with Baz, we did things like the first year, uh, they suddenly said, we booked you a, a tour of pubs in Stoke next week. You've got a week to make a pub show. So it was those, that being thrown in and that pressure to come up with something, actually working towards um, an outcome, which I think we, we carry on in, in desperate men. We're at our, at our best when we've got to come up with something, you know, we've got to deliver. Um, so that was, that was, from there I then ran a, ran a pub show group um, and ended up working on a Ken Campbell show with Paddy Fletcher, who... Uh, was in the dressing room over Christmas writing the Book of Jobs, which was a Desperate Men's show. So I sort of gave some ideas with Paddy, and um, that, in a way, was my passport when I met John and Richie to go, oh, yes, I've just worked with Paddy Fletcher. So. And then how did you join Desperate Men? Uh, well, I met John and Richie, uh, and then Shirley, um, in Bristol. I moved to Bristol in the early 90s and you were in the studio that we are now in yeah there, there was some huge rows going on with um <laughs> other really? members of desperate men at that point through the wall oh, and yeah. um two left <laughs> dick the lovely dick downey from pickled image and lucy goral barnes uh and lo and behold you know if you're looking for something it's usually right by you and and i was it i think but it was very funny richie um they must have had chats and um, when he asked me to join Desperate Men he gave me a great big spliff with would you like to do join Desperate Men written down the spliff so uh, <laughs> how could I resist? You smoked it and that was it yeah. yeah. Well then we did a show together, we did a show called Arms of an Angel which was a very bizarre odd show uh, that toured indoors, didn't make us any money, kind of economic suicide trying to tour indoors then when was, that, when was that? When was that? Ninety five, four, four, five, something like that. Um, and Richard was in that show. He was sort of we sort of made the show together, and yeah. by kind of default, you became a desperate men mm. member. And did, did anything change when Richard joined? Yeah, we all got a lot nicer, <laughs> <laughs> but less desperate, more optimistic. No, I don't know. Did we. Well, you were very bizarre in that show. It was a very bizarre show, yeah, it was and Richard bizarre. was Richard played a very bizarre part. Mm. It was a very strange show. We did it to a soundtrack. A lot of it was uh, <coughs> our musical director Shirley came up with a quite bizarre soundtrack, a, a sort of collage mix-up thing, all kinds of stuff. And we listened to it and went, "What? The f can we do that? What? It's like weird noises and music." He said, "Okay, we'll just we'll just choreograph the show to these all these sounds," 
and it was it was quite extraordinary. Yeah, it was about the arms trade. It was about landmines at the time. So uh, I guess it was. But it was funny. Uh, uh, yes. And was a lot of your work? I'm sure it was. Or is it? Um, was a lot of your work inspired by the political climate I, of I, the time? I think it. I think it has been inspired. Um, probably, as they say, with a small p. Uh, and we've tried to keep that going. We we sort of scratch issues that we're interested in at the, at the time. Uh, and they usually have a political edge to them. Um, but we're not, you know, well, we can do, always, just yeah. do entertainment. But um, I think of that, that that's, that's been a plus for Desperate Men, but also it's, it's, you know, commercially that hasn't always been the best decision. Um, you've got to have a sort of mixed bag of work, really. Uh, I mean, the current show, Slapstick and Slaughter, uh, is you know about war, uh, and it's bizarre, and it's physical, and it's stupid, and it's comic, but it doesn't sell greatly. Mm-hmm. So we have it in the cupboard. It works well for us. <laughs> we pull it out. It's, it's also about Dada. Yeah. Because we looked. Uh, I mean, I think we do. Um, we do look at current issues. We do take topical issues, and and obviously we're involved and informed about the world and the things that are around us affect the work that we do, but we're not polemical or political or proselytising in that kind of way. It's not like we have a message, but we we try and reflect things that we're concerned about or interested in in the work that we do. So we yeah. so some of it may be political in that way. Hmm. So I, when you work together, how does, how does it... Um, what's the creative process between the two of you? There's there's a lot of talking, yeah. a lot of sitting and talking and thrashing around, and a lot of wrestling with physical. Physical can be physical, but no, a lot of um, a lot of research, a lot of thinking, uh, a lot of distilling, a lot of ca- making connections. Um, so and it takes a long time, and that's uh, ideally. Um, it's kind of in between doing everything else, doing in, in between. Uh, staring at your computer screen and doing all your digital stuff that you seem to have to be swamped by these days. You, when you get bored with that, you turn around and have a conversation about, oh, that bit about, you know, maybe we could make one of those and we could do yeah. this and maybe we could talk about that. And have you seen this thing? Maybe we could use that. So the yeah. conversations go on quite a long time and, um, you know, we have a little idea of what it, what the show might be. But the key is bringing in really good collaborators who get it, who are open for a, for the process just to explore. Okay, so interesting to talk about is collaboration. Yeah. How, how do you find those partners? Uh, well, sometimes we see people's work, sometimes they write to us. Um, it just depends. At the moment we're working uh, with uh, Rod. Rod McLachlan who uh, is into um, sound and projections and lighting. Th- lighting and that kind of thing. But actually, we've invited him on a journey f- right from the early, early process. So um, we're doing some Without Walls um, uh, funded R&D around a show called Departure, which potentially is our last sh- show. Uh, and it's looking back at the 40 years of film archive that we got. We've, we've got it back. Bristol University have our archive, so we've got it back, and there's boxes of DVDs. And actually, it isn't the shows that's, that's interesting. It's uh, things like Richie filmed a week away in 2002, a week on the road, um, going to the Commonwealth Games in Manchester, and then on to do Rick, Dick and Vic, which is our dance show at the time in Morecambe. And it's the stuff around the touring that's interesting. It's the lifestyle. It's it's the endless miles of motorway that he filmed and packing the truck. Packing that he filmed a whole pack of a truck that maybe to get out of it. We used to, <laughs> we yeah, yeah, to get out of it. But that's in, that's interesting material, you know. We used to joke that if you want to audition somebody for Desperate Men, it's nothing to do with whether they can act or perform. No. It's can you drive for three hundred miles in the pouring rain, get to the gig, set up in the pouring rain. Uh, not do the gig because it's cancelled after <laughs> after your huge four hour setup and three hour takedown. Not do the gig because it's pouring the rain. 
drive all the way home through tons of traffic and still keep your sense of humour and then put all this stuff away at the end of it and, and you know and, and be still be nice to people yeah. and that's the audition really because because that's kind of when we were touring a lot that was 90% of the work actually the actual gigs actually doing the shows is about 10% of the work or less sometimes because you spend hours driving packing setting up doing all that stuff and so you know I don't know how we did it we, well we were younger we could have the energy to do all that setting up and then then do a show as well um, so now you're looking anyway. for collaborators that can pack the van yeah. yeah well no we look for collab I think I think it's important I think collaboration is not about consensus it's not about all kind of agreeing a, a way of working together particularly or or what you're going to do it's actually giving giving your collaborators a bit of autonomy to do what they do best and and you finding that balance between what you do and again a lot of conversation and sometimes because we work with people from different disciplines um, it's sometimes very difficult to, to have quite the same language we have a shorthand between us and between other performers that maybe lighting designers or dancers don't ha have quite that same language I remember working with a uh, dancer Ginny Farman and we uh, working on Rick Dick and Vic which was three men three old men dancing three 50 year olds dancing yeah, not that old uh, not that old um, and we were rehearsing and she said just can you do that bit slow just do that bit slow and we went yeah okay and then we're always trying to do it slow and she said no sl slow like you know slow we went yeah we are doing it slow she said no no do it really slow and there was this whole sort of conversation about what does slow mean, because because as actors rather than dancers, there was there was something else going on, and we were, we spent like a couple of hours just kind of investigating what do you mean by slow or move like this or move like that, and it was a whole for me it was like oh you know there's a different vocabulary, or it's the same vocabulary but it actually means something a little bit different, so that was really interesting exploring that. You know how other people look at things. Like a digital artist looks at things very differently than than a visual artist or a maker or a prop maker or, or a dancer or a musician. You know, musicians have another language about slow, fast. You know, <laughs> what does it mean? So I think that's really interesting. That's what I like about collaboration is just learning other people's perspective. You know, you've done quite a wide range of work over the years it hasn't just been about you performing has it you've done no, quite a lot of you know engaging people in the I work. think I think that's one of the interesting things of desperate men is we've been it's an artist led company we haven't really grown in terms of the admin base that we have it's always been four or six the same people leading the projects it's been me and John probably for the last 16 17 years doing that and we, I think we were the first ones to get organisational development, uh, first street performers who had that, which what we wanted to crack, the nut we wanted to crack is how can we make a 12 month a year income? We were doing fine from April to September. We employed uh, a group of performers for all that time. Then September they'd all go off and we'd sit all winter uh, in the office for no pay. So it's how we could make that. And... Um, so that led to six months discussion and we came up with this idea of Project X, which was which we've developed since then, Project X has We still don't know what it is. Because <laughs> the, the Arts Councils, what did they say to us? We was rather maverick and... Um, uh, it was a bit very maverick and you, yeah, you don't know how to brag about yourselves or you should, yeah. you, you should brag more. But they, they said in those days, uh, desperately, I said, we said to South West Arts as it was then, you know, what do you think of Desperate Men? What do we do? And they said, well, you do weird things in weird places. And that was how the outdoors was seen then, as a weird place, you know. And it was only in that sort of 90s period that there suddenly was an investment. Was it David Micklin report? Yeah. The Arts Council? Yeah. There was suddenly the, the um, ZAP were doing National Street Arts Festivals. There was investment and there was investment uh, for organisational development. And we came up with the idea after being approached by Sue Goodwin from Shropshire 
she came and uh, we did the seven project which was suddenly uh, our winters weren't doing gigs wasn't a gig economy it was planning um, large projects and that's where we got our enough income to earn 12 months a year and so since 2006 really we've done large outdoor projects so the seven project um, the Y Valley River Festival battle for the winds for the Olympics they were all projects we could draw down enough to give ourselves a 12 month a year uh, income which was really important that was the first us. time we paid ourselves a wage yeah we said we can actually because we could plan ahead and we said okay we've got five yeah. five or ten grand whatever it is coming in over that whole year to make this project work we said okay we can actually hey we can actually pay ourselves 200 pounds a week here wow you know all so, year so we we've, we've in a way was, developed those skills to be mm directors and cultural strategists and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. I think the unique thing of us is we're still the silly boys who go out and do the performing. <laughs> so one minute we're welcoming local authority people into the festival with our suits on or smart jackets and the next minute we're out goofing around. And I think that really confuses people, you know, normally you're one thing or the other. Yeah. But I think we like that, we like still being out there. Yeah. And the Battle for the Winds was the sort of one of the big cultural Olympiad projects, wasn't it? You were kind of yeah. doing the southwest that version. That was across seven counties. Yeah. So we had teams in seven counties all converging on Weymouth where we did a show on the beach. I think it was for 11,000 people. Uh, and John organised a fantastic, um, with uh, Emily Way, a big uh, torch walk into the sea with over 2,000 people. 2,012 people, yes. Um, walking Anna, into the sea with torches, yes. Which, yes which was amazing. Uh, we did a trial the year before and we was about 50, you know, just walked into the sea and suddenly after about 20 feet we all went underwater, you know. <laughs> but luckily it got very calm and, and the problem was there is that the uh, IOC and the BBC had so much focus on London that they really weren't interested in anything that was going on in, in Weymouth. You know, in fact, the IOC were horrified that we were going to bring 10,000 people to the beach because it was going to block the roads for the sailors to come along. Uh, and then when we did the night show and 2,000 people walked into the sea, BBC suddenly went, this is amazing, we should have got a helicopter up, you know, mm. and filmed it, but mm. too late. But you tell them, you tell them. There's a whole big story with all of that. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you don't, go there. No. don't want to go there. No. Don't want to go there. You made a film last year, year before? We made a film with Nathan Hughes from Rough Glory Films. Uh, we made a whole series of films with um, for Bristol Green Capital uh, called Bristol Loves Tides. There's a massive tidal flow in The Seven, uh, Bristol Channel, second highest in the world, 46 feet, uh, and not many people who live in Bristol know about it. So we did a series of films about uh, the tides, and we played the tides made flesh, Proxy and Perry, because there's Proxy and tides and Perigee and tides, if you want to look it up, the moon, different phases of the moon. So we played Proxy and Perry, the two tides, and we made some films for, for kids, a sort of series of films. Uh, and then we'd go into schools, we'd show them the film and then the two characters would walk in. We were all sort of covered in mud and life jackets and kind of weird creatures from the sludge of the tides. But then we went off to make a film in Spain. We got a bit of money and we said, let's go to Spain for a week and film it all there. And we'd just be concentrated in one place. It's fairly cheap, we can all fly out. So we went to Almira, Alicante. Yeah. Somewhere like that, one of them Spanish places. Isleta del Moro. And uh, Isleta del Moro, mm. si. And so we made the last film in the series for the kids, but at the same time, we made a film about us and our relationship. Slightly playing um, cartoon versions of ourselves, or sort of lifting ourselves up a bit, so having arguments about what the hell are we doing and why are we working for kids in schools and it's terrible I never want to work with kids again and oh god and we're 
talking to them about the environment and it's uh, the world's hopeless, it's all falling apart. What we why are we going into schools and telling kids it's all lovely when in fact it's doom laden and all this. So that's sort of question. anyway, there's a film called Washed Up and it's probably gonna be out online soon. Yeah. It's been gone round a lot of film festivals. But it's a very it was a great it was a great film, Nathan you have to see it, but it's kind of it's kind of influenced by Sergio Leone and those kind of big landscapes and then close-ups. I think a lot of people in the outdoor arts sector sort of <clears throat> chime with them over working relationships and what we're all doing. So I mean, if anybody wants a link, of. I'll send you the link and you can watch yeah. it. It's a nice film. Yeah. So I've got those set questions oh. I oh, to yeah. ask you, um, which is that what's your earliest memory of seeing something outdoors well I thought about that and I couldn't actually remember what first bit of outdoor arts I'd seen because actually it probably wasn't even called outdoor arts then I don't know what it was street theatre or agit prop and I thought jokingly I thought first thing was I remember snail racing as as a kid we used to do snail races with my sisters which was great that was the first outdoor arts I did but I think probably 1968 anti-Vietnam War demonstrations in London and there was somebody like Bread and Puppet or one of those okay. people doing, doing agit prop stuff and probably covering themselves in blood and lying on the floor or something like that. And I can't remember it specifically, but that's the first sort of thing I remember. And then stuff I did at Bradford Art College, I suppose. Yeah. With Roland Miller, we did the Cyclamen Cyclists, which is great. There's a very little documentation of that, but we all were all in pink, Cyclamen pink, had bicycles painted pink, handkerchiefs pink, socks pink, hair pink, everything pink, and and the gig was we had a little kind of pub show thing, a few poems or something. We go to a pub. Uh, we had a map of several pubs around Bradford and we had a big set of dice and we'd do our little show and then throw the dice and we'd go to whichever pub that was. So sometimes we go to the same pub three times in a day. So it was a kind of pub crawl, um, but we were all in pink. And, uh, and it was Al Beach and Mick Banks and Roland Miller were involved in that and various people. And that was, one, that was my first sort of being part of a... Oh. Of a but sort of gig, yeah, an outdoor yeah. gig, yeah. yeah. A lot of cycling and drinking. Yeah. <laughs> Richard? Well, mine isn't particularly street theatre. but I think I was brought up in Teddington in London and I used to love sitting by the um, river and watching the tide come in and uh, there were lots of parked cars and just watching the tide come and flood those cars <laughs> and then wait for the owners to come back. I always, I found that fantastic. <laughs> and the uh, live art. The other exciting thing as a kid was going to Hampton Court on Easter Monday and the fun fair. Just that trip out to a fun fair and running across the grass and seeing all the rides there and that. And we were only allowed, you know, two rides or something. Yeah. But a fun fair was very exotic. Yeah. Just the whole characters and the, the painted stalls and, and, and everything was uh, wonderful. You've talked about a lot of inspirational people. Anybody you would pick out of who inspired you? God, blimey, so many after so many years. Um, I have to mention Albert Hunt again from Bradford Art College because I think he set a lot of people off in, in that, that kind of direction. Um, I didn't realise it at the time, what he was kind of showing us and getting us to do really. As an 18 year old I had no idea what was really going on, but I still go back to that time. Yeah. Fort Beard, Fort Beard Fort Fantasy, Beard. the British Square Dance, and there were two of them with boards strapped to their feet, to each other's feet, trying to sort of do a pattern together that was completely bizarre and bonkers. Um, people Show. I think I saw early versions of People Show and Welfare State also at Bradford when I was at Bradford Art College. And they stayed with me and People Show doing surreal and extraordinary things. I always remember a woman um, on stage and her husband's there reading the paper and 
ignoring ignoring her and she she gets a Mars bar out and starts to eat it and then and then she puts the Mars bar on his shirt and irons the Mars bar into the shirt <laughs> so the the theatre filled with the smell of burning chocolate and it was a sort of she was you know grinding the Mars bar into his head because he, you know <laughs> stuff like that it was like oh, I want to do that you know that is just like I want to do that you know <laughs> lots of moments though well, those yeah, those early shows at at, at university that used to yeah. come by really, yeah. um, um, but and pa- and Paddy again, you know, Paddy Fletcher really mm. for me, mm. uh, I really wanted to be him. And if you don't know Paddy Fletcher, uh, if you Google Paddy Fletcher, Piers Brosnan, and Richard and Judy, then you'll uh, come across a very interesting afternoon. Um, <laughs> ITV programme. Paddy worked at the um, Oval, uh, where Piers Brosnan started, yeah. in he the youth theatre there, yeah. yeah. Mm. So uh, they, they bring out Paddy, uh, much, much to Piers' uh, embarrassment, I think. <laughs> but it, unfortunately, <laughs> Paddy's now dead, but the Incubus was a, a fantastic company, just really went out there. They did street as well as uh, indoors. People like Patty B worked with them, um, who's, you know... And, and was, Ross was, was, you know, Ross with the, the medicine show, you know, fantastic work. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're sort of heroes, really. Well, it's the sense of anarchy that they mm. engendered that was what was inspiring and exciting, is that you could do anything, and you could do extraordinary and mad, wonderful things. And I think that was that was what turned me on. I just went, I just want to be bonkers. I just want to go out there and do crazy shit, you know. So I still want to do weird shit, you know. People say, "What do you do?" and I say, "Weird shit," you know. It's like shorthand for what do you? Do? How do you explain what do you do? It's like really difficult. It's are people still doing weird shit? <laughs> you, you, some people are. Not, there's not a lot of it about. It's all a bit, a bit mainstream, really. I think we've bought in. I've got to be careful now. What well, I say now. I've got to be careful what I say. I know. I was provoking it. We yeah. were all. We were suckered in to be professionalised and be professional, and I think a lot of us talk, took the shopping centre buck, uh, the regeneration, and I think it has affected the work. And I think um, things like Extinction Rebellion have come back to bite us on the bottom because I think we're yeah, off the pace absolutely. now with a lot of the work. Um, I think we've got a lot of catching up to do, but of course it's not commercially viable. Mm. Who's going to buy, you know, Extinction Rebellion type stuff? It's not going to happen. So yeah, but they're doing good luck to prop them. Now. They're, they're, they're yeah. the agit prop stuff. You know, that's where the theatre mm. is. Mm. You know, mm. Greta Thunberg. What fantastic theatre! Mm. Yeah. So if somebody's considering going into the outdoor arts sector. What would be your advice? I think don't get a re- proper job. Well, I would, <laughs> I would say don't restrict yourselves to outdoor arts. Yes. You know, feed yeah. yourself from wherever, wherever, and you will have to. You know, this week I did medical role play for two days, sixty scenarios um, of a man with dementia who was pissing himself. You know, I had to do He's that. He's brilliant at it. He's really good. I'm at really it. good at it. You know, you have to say yes. <laughs> just say yes to a broad range of work, and yeah. Explore the outdoors if you're interested. But you've got to like people and you've got to like interacting with people and not be thrown by the elements. But if you just want to sort of ponce around in a black box theatre space, then carry on. But that's moribund, it's dead. Ooh. And I thought I was going to be controversial. All right, really set the cat among the pigeons. Yeah, well, you know, come on. Indoor theatre, it's dead. It's dead. <laughs> So I think on that <laughs> note, it's the one stop it, isn't it? I think. Um, but I wonder if any of you got any questions to ask these two, yeah. two these two sages. <laughs> when you were a kid, you used to sit by the window and watch the car get flooded. Have you uh, reenacted this? Have you done anything to do with that? We've tried. We've, all, we've done the show with that. We've often thought within the work we have to try and recreate nature natural occurrences we had years ago with the uh, whale that came up the Thames hundreds of thousands of people went down to see the whale and we always thought 
That's what we need to do, is come up with ideas that people are impelled. They must come down and see it. And that's, that's you know, the that's really hard. The compelling image. The compelling image. We call it the giraffe on a raft. You know, how do you, you know, how do you top nature? You might have to explain giraffe on a raft. It's become our shorthand for finding the compelling image. And it came from uh, working on the Seven Project and working in Shrewsbury, where Charles Darwin was born. And we thought about Darwin coming back up the river to Shrewsbury from his travels, like Dr. Doolittle on a raft with the, the push me pull you or whatever. And we thought if you got a giraffe on a raft coming up the river to Shrewsbury, everybody would go and see it. You know, th there's no way if you heard that there was a giraffe coming up on a raft up the Severn River, you'd go, I want to go and see that. Mm -hmm. So I became our shorthand for how do you find the, what's the giraffe on the raft thing? So you can you can have that for nothing, then you can give that away. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> that was all right. Um, I just wanted to ask quite quickly, because you mentioned, obviously, some previous performers like Welfare State, etc., um, and you mentioned Extinction Rebe Rebellion, but are there any companies touring that you can think of that you think still do really inspiring, unusual, work kind of like the work that you do other than yourselves of course the problem is I don't see enough stuff it's very difficult to get round to see I don't, I don't know the outdoor arts world as well as I used to we used to do we used to be at every festival all around the country from Glastonbury to all the others but we don't do that kind of work anymore so I don't I don't pretend to be au fait with with contemporary practice very much actually so I don't know a lot of the companies but does someone else know. know I don't know I couldn't I wouldn't presume to name a, a, any particular companies actually it seems to be that some festivals do book anarchic work but it's usually from France or Spain mm -hmm. yeah. they're the sort of you know that they can afford to be anarchic because they've got good subsidies so they can take plenty of time to come up with a show that's kind of more anarchic whereas here I think we are a bit stuck uh, with the mainstream you know it's become a kind of career thing it's all a bit organized and you, you're not going to do anything too controversial or provocative or political because you're not going to get gigs for it if you if you, if you want to make a living if you want to sustain a business model for a, for a theatre company an outdoor theatre company you kind of have to play the game um, and and do things that are family friendly, entertaining, all the rest of it. It's quite hard to push the envelope, and that's what's interesting about Extinction Rebellion right now. And the Red Brigade or the Red Rebel Brigade, as they're calling themselves now, because I don't think they knew the history of the Red Brigade from it's Italy, who were a terrorist organisation. So, uh, and I think they just missed that. Anyway, they're now the Red Rebel Brigade, but they're doing quite. You know, Extinction Rebellion is a whole kind of movement in itself, obviously, and there's a lot of theatrical elements to that. They're using theatre as a tactic to get people's attention, and the Red Rebel Brigade is, is a brilliant example of that. And the Red Women who from Greenpeace who went to the Mansion House speech last night and got manhandled by Tory bastards, Tory bastards... Um, <laughs> You know that that's 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 the kind of theatre now. That's the as you prop. That's that's the anarchic stuff that is I think is really important now, and I think that's missing from a lot of uh, the mainstream. And I call it mainstream work now in, in outdoor arts. It's all a bit safe. It's yeah. nice. It's all the rest of it. And it goes back to as Richard was saying when there was a time when when um, uh, if a shopping centre was, was going downhill a bit, they'd send in the clowns to regenerate it. Oh, let's put some street theatre in there, and then people will want to go shopping, you know. And uh, that's what we ended up doing a lot of, you know. And we got, we got gigs, we got work, and we go, OK, it's Basildon, it's a Tuesday afternoon, it's the shopping centre, it's like, oh, God. Yeah, but we need the money, let's go and do it, you know. Uh, but actually, we were being kind of being used... Um, by, you know, in a good way, councils had a good, you know, they wanted to get more exciting stuff happening in places like that. But but um, it's it taken the wind out of our sails as provocateurs, as agitators, as 
disruptors of the public realm, which I think is really important. And we're sort of losing that. I think, I, just as a metaphor, I've been reading a lot about um, uh, rewilding. And I think the street arts sector needs a bit of rewilding because it's been under this intensive agricultural system and subsidies for so long that it needs to be rewilded. There you go. Whatever that Hurrah! Means. Hurrah! Does anybody Rewild the street arts. Does this. anybody disagree with this? Okay. I just thought it might be a counter-argument. You yeah. might say, well, actually, my work is quite political. And yes. No, I'm not coming with a counter-argument at all. It's just you, you, you made the link quite a lot between sort of commercial survival mm. and the disappearance of that anarchic edge. I'm sort of curious as to how in your earlier days was, was was the economy different was it just that you were younger you had less needs financially or how did that i think work? it's partly that i think it's partly when you're young and you don't have a mortgage or rent to pay you know we were driving around europe in, in living in a van and living in squats and on people's floors and we could do that in our 20s and early 30s you know um so i think it's it's your own economic pressures you know when you get a family and you've got to pay a mortgage you've got to pay the bills it's a bit different. But I also think that in, you know, you go back to the 70s, apparently uh, you paid about between 7 and 10% of your income went on rent. Now it's something like 40, 50, 60% of your income goes on bloody rent. So, so then it was easier to get by on less. You know, you could afford to go, I'll take two weeks off work and go and do some shows. Now it's really difficult. You have to make the bucks. So I think I think economically that's a really big force that's you know people have to make a living much more than you did then then you could get away with I, I don't have to make a living well, I'll survive wasn't you know, the latest by, figures you know. two percent of actors are making a living two percent of, of actors are, are employed of have, yeah. but that's actors we're not actors well I am you are yes I, so, am. Yeah, I actually do I want to turn it on its head because I actually think. You know, if we classify it as corporate entertainment, you know, working shopping centres and in businesses, mm. I think we are getting to infiltrate them, even though it yes. has to be cleaner. They're actually paying for the anarchists to come and go, oh, this is lovely. Yes. So, is it, you know, it's not that we're losing out, we're actually getting invited in. Do you know? That's that, true. And that's lucky. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe you, you wouldn't push it as far as you would at a festival, but you can push it a little bit. Yeah. And they're getting exposed to people like us. You know, they see, like, I do a corporate Christmas show, and the security there went, we n I've never seen circus before. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. that guy got exposed to yeah. it. He's not going to go into an outdoor arts festival. So. No, I think that's true. I think that's also true, yeah, yeah that actually you, c you can be a bit subversive. You can go take the corporate shilling and, and actually subvert their expectations, yeah, you know. They think they're going to get an apple, and you give them three bananas, and they go, "What's that?" You know, <laughs> thought we were getting but, but, an apple. But one of the most disturbing things I saw in a shopping centre was an inflatable snow globe with Father Christmas in the globe, <laughs> just waving out at the kids, and it was this really safe sort of interaction. We can't have the children near Father Christmas, you know. I haven't. We haven't done. In. We haven't done Christmas gigs. We haven't done Christmas gigs for a long time because it's so... I just don't want to be out there getting people we, to shop. We know? used to do the ghastly family go Christmas shopping. <laughs> <laughs> it was a ghastly family. Anybody else? Yes. I should have asked you to say your names and we would have known each other by the end of this. Hello, I'm Richard. Um, I had a question about your creative process taking it off the anarchy yeah. which I think is all to do with student loans as opposed to grants anyway but that's right. another matter because yeah. yeah. you're already in the system you're stuck there forever anyway um, you talked about the giraffe on a raft and it, you sort of almost sound like sculptures you start with the in film they call it a MacGuffin you know the thing you're chasing at the end so does your creative process work from an image outwards or do you get to that image at the end of your creative process now yeah ouch. Both both ways. I think we start from both both ends or either. Do you start end with the thing that looks good, and then. Go? I think we, we start with you know ideas. What would 
what would kind of work what would be extraordinary or, or interesting or c could we you know could we stand on our heads and paint ourselves blue or you know could we build us something or is that a sort of I don't know but it could also start so uh, last year's Y Valley River Festival I wrote a show Heart to Heart mm. which started actually the roots of it was with the noise of a leaf blower and then I suddenly thought, that's a baddie, Lord Leaf Blower. Because everyone hates leaf blowers. And leaf is obviously a name. And that then created a whole sort of connection court type thing. So it's looking for that spark. We, we did um, a show in Brighton in the back of our truck. Uh, and John went over and bought some cheese from a cheese shop. And it was stinking bishop cheese, which I don't know whether you know, really stinks. Very smelly, yeah. And I was outside the truck. The audience came in three at a time, so you can imagine there was quite a queue build up. And then I started improvising around this lump of cheese. And we started talking about, uh, in the truck, we're talking about bears, that this family has come over uh, with bears. And then I started talking about this cheese being camembert. Uh, it bears cheese. <laughs> it's almost like a camembert. So this bears cheese, I said, well, you know, they're, they're, this is how we supplement us coming over. We're selling this, da, da, da. Then the Organic Food Festival said, have you got an idea for the food festival? And I said, all right, uh, dancing bear cheese. So we then created a cheese product. We had promotional film materials, that kind of thing, and then went around food festivals selling bears cheese. <laughs> Uh, and then that flipped back into the show, the, the miracle show that we did. They worship bears. But the inspiration Fam came from a lump of cheese. So, yeah. <laughs> but it goes like that, you know. <laughs> also, the Dada show, the, you know, there's tons of inspiration in looking into Dada. But one of the things for Slapstick and Slaughter that we really liked was, was um, must have been Cabaret Voltaire, and they'd raise the curtain just to just below your knees and then do bits of Shakespeare, but you could only see people's feet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just thought that was a great idea. And we, and we came across, we were working in the studio, in our studio, and just arsing about with various ideas. And on the wall was a big square canvas that somebody had given us. And we thought, well, let's just take it off the wall and play with that and hide behind it and so we could lift it up and show our feet. And we'd just try and do a little show with our feet what can we do with our feet and that canvas came off the wall and then we thought actually this is quite fun playing with this big canvas and we can pop over the head to the top of it and then the side of it and lift it up and turn it round. so we just played with that and then that became in the show and then we commissioned somebody to make us a, a special painting that was based on the first world war and then we said it's got to fit in the back of the car because we, we wanted to just have a small show that was just the two of us so we got him to split it in half and fold it up and we'd go in the back of an estate car so that kind of just grew from accidental what we found in the studio there was another time we found you might have seen got stop Lark had gone for well, I was say another time and then there was another time you, you and then there was the on, time and then there was you the time you do go on um, <laughs> thank you that's I fantastic do go on. <laughs> Thank you so much, you two. Thank That's, you. I've loved it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, us. Thank you. Thank you, audience. I'm sure you can go on chatting to them and asking them. <laughs> but, uh, well, I was going to say, the other thing that gave us, gave us a living for quite a long time, we got gigs for probably 15, probably nearly 20 years, we got, got work. When we were playing in a studio in Amsterdam, way way back before Richard with Richie, uh, with these dancers uh, that we were working with, and in the studio was a drain pipe, plastic drain pipe, and we'd been doing a load of contact dance at that time, you know, where you just move around, touch each other. So we put the uh, danced with this drain pipe between us. So we were sort of doing all this dancey stuff in this drain pipe. You know. And in the corner was also there was a little kitchen in this place, and there was a pair of rubber gloves, and um, somebody stuffed them with paper and put them on our heads like this. So we had these floppy, stuffed rubber gloves on our heads, and then we made a balaclava with the stuffed rubber gloves, and a black cloak, and a and a bit of black drain pipe, and they became the pipe people. And we got gigs. We did that on the street. 
for 20 years, we'd go out with these floppy, floppy rubber gloves on our heads, balaclavas, dark glasses, and a length of drain pipe, which we'd talk down, we'd dance with, we'd worship it, we'd do rituals with it, we'd hold it out and say, excuse me, we're holding an opinion poll. Stuff like that. <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> but, but that just came from what we found in the studio and, and arsing around, just messing around, you know. People First. often, it's like when people say, what do you do? You say, well, we do weird shit. And they go, well, what are you doing today? You go, well, we're farting around, you know. That's what you do. You play around in the studio and you find things and things come up and you go, hey, actually, that's quite interesting. I think that's also ladies, with you know. people. If you're looking for something, it's often by you. Invest in the people around you rather than thinking the rescue is out there. We are the people. You are the people who can make something happen. Right? Thank you. <laughs> Have we got to get out? Yeah. Hope to see you later. Thank you very much. Thank you.